All right, a uh, friendly reminder that everyone should have a whiteboard on their desk and a notebook ready to go. Uh, you have a test on Thursday. Uh, Focus and Spice are due. Uh, tomorrow your map is due, so please make sure you have that completed and ready to go. On Friday we have primary, uh, nope, we don't have primaries. On Friday we have your DBQ. You'll be getting that. It's on imperialism. It's actually one of my favorites. It's actually very interesting. Um, so I really like this DBQ. You'll be writing this this weekend. Oh, and you'll be doing other essays. This is a three-day weekend, baby. We got to do it. It is? Yes. Give no school Monday. Yes. All right. We still have things to do, whether you want to celebrate or not. So we have a very busy couple days, so let's get to it. On the top of your notebook, you should have week 23. We're in imperialism. Here we go. So, imperialism is when one country dominates another country socially, politically, economically for economic interests. Imperialism is when a country dominates another country or uh, another country socially, politically, economically in order to ensure economic gain. Okay, so imperialism is when one country takes over another country, socially, politically, economically, in order to ensure economic gain. Now, we also have a new thing called military imperialism, which you also need to write down. Military imperialism is the need for ports around the world for refueling. Ports around the world for refueling. This is the first time we need these. Why? What new piece of technology are we using, Vance? I was going to say oil. What, but what's the technology, Jesse? Steamships. We have steamships for the first time. We're not using wind-powered boats anymore, so we need ports for allow us to refuel. If we were an American ship, would we want to pull into a Russian harbor and let the Russians onto our ship to see all the technology? No, we wouldn't. We want to pull our American ship into an American port, correct? So we can keep our state secrets and we're not sharing information with the enemy. That's what military imperialism is. Do we still have military imperialistic ports today? Yes. Who can raise their hand and tell me a place that is was created for military imperialism? That we conquered as a country. Garrett. Iceland. We didn't conquer Iceland. And no one gives a shit about Iceland. Ben. Huh? Hawaii is one. Uh, Hawaii also we want cheap sugar, which we're going to get to. What else? That's Hawaii. Okay, Guam is the perfect example. Do we still hold on to Guam today? Yes. Why? Because of its militaristic, imperialistic possibilities. Okay? What? Chinese speaking. They are making an island. That is military imperialism as well. What? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Like, if you were paying attention to any of the uh, Venezuela stuff, they would just call America the imperialistic America. They would just call us imperialistic America. Instead of saying America, they would say imperialistic America. That's all they would say the whole damn time. Imperialistic America. Imperialistic America. Imperialistic America. Because are we imperialistic? Yes, we are. Are we not as bad as some other nations? No, we're not as bad. But are we still imperialistic? You bet your bottom dollar. Do we do terrible things? Of course. However, not as bad as England. I don't know if that's really the standard we want to hold, but here we are. Okay. So, motivations for imperialism. Obviously, just say, write your spice theme. Social, political, economic, culturally. But you also really need to know there's a religious component to this. Now, I think you can agree taking over another country for your own benefit is a bad thing to do. Also very rude. With that being said, they're going to say, well, I'm giving you Jesus, so it can't be that bad. Yes, I'm stealing all of your stuff, but I gave you Jesus. Okay, so religion is going to be a big thing. You're going to put in parentheses the French. The French are notorious for this. The French are the ones doing forced conversions. Now, we're also going to have demographic reasons. We're going to have criminal population and descent populations. What is the most famous criminal population colony? What do you got, Macy? Australia. 
Australia is the most famous one, and I would put that right next to it as a good example. Okay? Australia was founded by a bunch of prisoners. And then people realize, oh, it's really a lovely place to live. So then regular people start showing up there. Okay, manifest destiny. There are two connotations for it. Who can tell me the first connotation for it? Jesse? Um, so it's like um, where, like, it's that. It's like when America is going to spread from coast to coast. Who can help clean that up for <laughs> What is uh, manifest destiny? Oh, God. Avery? It's the idea that America should go from the Atlantic. If, and it's a God-given right, correct? God told us we have this right, and it's our land to take. Okay, now we have a new version of this, post-industrialization, that we have the right to take all the raw materials and exploit the cheap labor, because if God didn't want us to do it, he wouldn't allow it. I like that justification. Seriously. Manifest destiny post-industrialization is that because the natural resources exist, we have the right to take them. Because the people are here, we have the right to exploit them. Now, there are very famous populations that are going to be exploited in this. Who can raise their hand? You should write these down as well. What are some famous populations of immigrants that are going to be exploited during this time? Macy? The Chinese. Chinese, what do they do? Railroads, write that down. Chinese are building railroads. What else is another famous immigrant population that is going to be exploited? My people. What do you got, Alex? Indian. I'm not Indian. <laughs> There's nothing about me that looks Indian. I have no idea what. She's Irish. I'm Irish. I'm Irish. I'm Irish. I'm Irish. I'm Irish. Katie, what population? Irish, and where are they exploited? Factory work. Factory work for sure. And then you have your uh, former slaves, your African Americans. Where are they being exploited? Very fancy word for it. It starts with an S. Clear? Oh. Sharecroppers in the South. Anyone know what a sharecropper is? Okay. They, they pay their rent by working the land. They don't get pretty much anything additional to it. So it's basically slavery. It's, in, it's slavery 2.0. That's sharecropping, right? That's not even to know So these are exploited uh, segments of American society, and it says it's justified by this new manifest destiny point. Oh, you said there's a criminal population of the It's criminal and dissent population. So if you don't agree with the government, they just send you away. Okay. Justification for imperialism. You're going to write that down as your new heading. Justification for imperialism. First things first, we got this new book title called The White Man's Burden. And it is written by Rudyard Kipling. You need to know his name and you need to know his book. White Man's Burden. It is exactly what you think it is. It is a white man's responsibility to bring intellect culture, and business to non-Western areas. That it is white people's responsibility to educate non-Westerners in the way of culture, intellect, and business. Now, ladies and gentlemen, have we learned that this is completely fake news? Yeah. Yes. However, the French and the English use this the most. You should write that down. French and the English really buy into this, that they have to spread their knowledge. Jesus now, Rudyard Kipling wrote a second book. He wrote like five books, but Rudyard Kipling wrote a second book. Does anyone know what the other book he wrote? What is it, Shivani? The, the Jungle Book. What? So for those people who love The Jungle Book, you white supremacists. <laughs> it is all about the white man bringing education, culture, and identity to the jungle. That's yep. all the symbolism in it. Now, the Disney movie has obviously been adjusted slightly, <sighs> not that much, slightly, than the actual book. But if you want a real awakening, it's all supporting the jungle book supports white man's burden. It's still not my Disney, so it's still white watch. 
it's still not <laughs> <laughs> dumb now. But it's still all about the whole book is written for to support a white man's burden, people. He wrote it as a children's book to help indoctrinate white people to see that it's white men's burden. That's what that's what really evil people do. Alright, here we go. So Justifications for, we're still under the same title, you need to know that industrialization is causing hardships in westernized and industrialized countries. You need to know that industrialization is causing hardships. Okay, and people are upset, but imperialism increases white people's value, okay? So, being a white person living in a factory in London, does that sound like a good time? No. Nope. However, knowing that you are a white person in London and that you're more valuable than other British citizens of a different color made people feel better about themselves. Same type of cycle that happens here in the American South. Now, keep in mind, I'm from Boston. Apparently, I have the most racist city in the world. So, in the United States, not the world. The most racist city. But I can give, give a clear example here in the American South. Even if you are the poorest white trash person in the American South, you are still better than the wealthiest black person. That social identity, that social stratification, was so embedded and so important in the American South that they are literally going to go to blows in the 1960s and 70s to try to keep it intact. The biggest protectors of the Southern Confederation are going to be poor white people. Why do poor white people care the most about pride over Frenchiness? Why, Jesse? That they were still better than someone. Yes, yes. If you look at 2019, American South, like I'm talking deep South, is it the rich people that really care about Southern roots and tradition, or is it poor white people? It's poor white people. Those are your biggest purveyors of racism. I mean, we still got racism all over the place. It's not just poor white people. But you're going to see the biggest protectors of this whole Southern identity and that whole rebel flag and all that crap is mostly poor white people because it gives them a better circumstance. Because I'm white, I'm better than these people. Same thing's happening here. You need to know the name Cecile Rhodes. It's a big name. I put a star next to it. He said that imperialism stopped civil war from occurring. That without imperialization, a civil war would have broken out. Why do you think a civil war would have broken out? You're working your butt off, working 16 hours a day in a factory, and you felt that society didn't value you. Would you keep working or would you fight back? You fight back. However, if you were a white person working 16 hours a day and you knew that you were better than two-thirds of the world because you're white... Is that going to give you peace? Is it also going to give you peace that you can leave London and go to any British colony and you are now treated in the higher echelon of society? Yeah. So guess what happens? We have an exodus of white people, and you're writing this down, there's an exodus of white people from Western industrialized countries to colonies. Why do you think poor white people from England, France, Germany, are heading to colonies. Jackson. So they're like they're treated higher. For sure. You go from being a no one cares about you in London to all of a sudden you're in the top of society. Why? Because there's so many, so few white people in these colonies that all of a sudden now you're a big deal. Think of the ego. This is why racism exists is because it gives people ego boosts. Well, I'm better than you because I'm white. Yeah, I worked really hard on this. My mother gave it to me and my dad. Like, you're entitled to it by birth, correct? That's what racism is built upon because it gives you that ego, that self-identity that allows you to compare. Now, it's going to continue to exist and continue to get worse. And we're in justifications. You need to write tools or technology for imperialism. Okay, you need to know that if it wasn't for steamships, Globalized trade would not occur. Why? What is steamship? What's the 
What's the technological advancement of steamships? I mean, it's pretty flat out there, but what advance? They can go against currents. They can go against currents, um, and they're faster. They're just significantly faster. So I would make a note of that. Railroads, you need to put a big star. This is the most important invention that allows imperialization to occur. Why are railroads so important? Alex? Uh, so, for example, in Africa, they take the goods from the interior and drive them to port so that they can be exported. Okay, but what are the two big things we need railroads for? Whether you're in England or whether you're in uh, Africa. Maggie? And transportation of manufactured goods and raw materials, you need to have that done. Railroads are the most important aspect of imperialism. Okay. Now, infrastructure, you need to know the Suez Canal. What is the Suez Canal? Where is it located? Katie? Huh? Yeah, it's uh, Egypt. It's uh, part of Egypt today, so we'll just call it Egypt today. Okay. It is located in Egypt. You need to know it connects the Med Sea to the Red Sea. Why is this a big deal, ladies and gentlemen? Why is it a big deal, Vendela? There you go. So instead of having to sail from England all the way around the continent of Africa to get to India, like your boy Magellan, not Magellan. What's my boy? Who's the first one to sail around? Bartholomew Diaz gets to the horn. Vasco da Gama. Yeah. Same one. Okay. So uh, instead of sailing all around Lake Vasco da Gama, all the way around to India, now, which would take six months to do, now you can go in below Spain and cut all the way through the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. It takes about two and a half weeks. Is that a big change? Yes. Does that come with to increase trade worldwide? Yes. Okay. And then, of course, the Panama Canal, which you need to know connects the Atlantic and the Pacific, and it's located in Panama. Okay, which is way over here, which I want to see one day. Apparently, the locks is super cool. Yeah. Because the Atlantic is higher than the Pacific, so they have to, like, ships have to, it takes like an hour and a half to go through, uh, because they have to flood every section to go up or down. It's pretty cool. All right. Weapons is important. You do need to know that we're going to have um, the Maxim gun. That's the only one I really need you to know. I'm not a gun person. I'm not a military tactics person. But you do need to know the Maxim gun, which has 11 rounds per second. Someone asked me last year, well, how fast can guns fire today? Not a damn clue. But I would assume if you can do 11 rounds a second in the 1880s, we can do it in like 0.5 seconds. I have no idea. Not a, not a clue at all. When someone today will tell me. There'll be a gun person in here somewhere. All right. So a perfect example of the power of these weapons, and you need to know this, is used at the Battle of Oma Durham. You need to know this. Perfect example of how powerful these new weapons are is at the Battle of Omar Durham, which is between the Sudan and the British. This is the first direct conflict of industrialized powers versus Africans. Is this going to be the last? No, this just happens to be the first. The Sudanese and the British. You're going to see. And in five hours of, shoot, of fighting, the British are going to lose about 107 men, 111 men, and the Sudanese are going to lose 7,000. Is that significant? Yes, absolutely. This is the first real conflict. This is going to begin a trend of uh, industrialized powers coming to Africa. Now, this is continuing. We have communications. Okay, what? S-U-D-A-N-E-N-C. Uh, communications, you do need to know, after the Suez is built, a letter can get to England in about two weeks. Then we have a new piece of technology called the telegraph, which you absolutely need to know. Just the, you need to know the Suez Canal, yes. I don't care if you know it takes two weeks for mail to get through it. You do need to know the telegram is going to connect India and Britain with five hours. Keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, think about the American Revolution. Okay? So, we had our first shots fired. Okay? Then the governor of Massachusetts sent a letter to the King of England saying, Holy shit, they're fighting back. 
send more uh, men. Okay, so then that letter, in a big rush, gets put on a boat. And then it takes three and a half months to get to England. And then the king gets it within like a day. And he's like, holy shit, they shot guns three and a half months ago. Get the military ready. And then they're like, okay, two and a half weeks later. Because that's about how long it takes to prepare for a military. They're like, go. And they're like, yes. And then they get on a ship. And then they sit on that ship for three and a half months. And then... Seven to nine months later, after the first shots are fired, that us as Americans are just shooting and killing people, the British military shows up. And they're like, oh, what did we miss? Nine months of things. You missed nine months of things. So who had the upper hand? Who had the advantage? The Americans or the British? Americans. Here we are, 250 years later. We have the telegraph, Okay. There's a rebellion happening in India, which they're rebelling all the time. Don't you dare think the Indian people like the British. Hell no. They have a weird relationship with them, but no. They were abused. They uh, fought back. With that being said, there is a problem. There's a rebellion. The governor of India calls the Queen Victoria, who's in charge at the time, and they're like, holy shit, they're rebelling. There's a five-hour delay. And then the Queen is like, holy shit, let's move the military. Five-hour delay. Within 10 hours of this whole thing starting, guess who's there? The British military. So within 10 hours versus 9 months, we now have the militaries in full motion. Ladies and gentlemen, does that change things? Does that make who more powerful? The British or the imperializing powers. The telegram increases control over colonies. You need to know that. It is a very big Deal. So when we talked about colonies pre-industrialization <coughs> and colonies post-industrialization, who had it worse? Post-industrialized. These colonies are really going to be abused, manipulated, and pretty much destroyed. When we had our pre-industrialization ones, like us, there was a little bit more of a relationship to because we're on equal footing, correct? We have the same type of weapons, same type of skills, and there's so much distance. Now, the levels have changed. They're industrialized, these countries are not. They have tons and tons of weapons and can mechanize a huge war. These unindustrialized countries cannot. All right, here we go. India is your new heading. You need to know it has the nickname of the crown jewel of Britain. Why is it called the crown jewel of Britain? Alex? They have a lot of coffee. They what? They have a lot of coffee. Okay, they have a lot of coffee, but they have a lot of stuff, right? They have two huge resources. They have plenty of people. Plenty of people means plenty of? Workers. No, they don't care about workers. Taxes. Workers. No. They have plenty of people to purchase British goods, remember? Because we need markets and we need raw materials. We need someone to buy all of our manufactured goods. So they have a huge population, so we have a large market to sell all of our British goods to. We also have plenty of raw materials so we can export back to Britain so we can put British people to work. And then those British people are going to take all this Indian cotton, make it into a cloth, and then they're going to sell it to the Indians at an incredibly high price. Okay? So they had two major resources, they had large population, which means large markets, and then of course they had plenty of raw materials. The most important raw materials you need to write down is going to be cotton, because cotton can only grow three places in the world. Where does cotton grow? America, Egypt, India. Guess who controls e Egypt? The British control. You've seen the mummy, of course. The mummy? Have you ever seen the mummy? It's a classic. No? Okay. Anyway. Okay. They have tea, coffee, and of course cotton, and then we have a bunch of other major uh, things as well. Okay. You need to know that they are not going to, they arrive, you're going to put a star, the British arrive to India with a sphere of influence. What does that mean, a sphere of influence? What does that mean, Garrett? They already control the economy. They don't already control it. They're only going to. 
They're only going to control the economy. Eventually, <coughs> you need to know, eventually, they're only there for a sphere of influence. Eventually, they're going to kick out the Mughal, and then they're going to control it on a full-on colony. When you're a colony, you control what? The whole spice. Social, political, economic, environmental, all that stuff. Okay, so... Originally, when the British arrive, they are there for a sphere of influence. The Mughal Empire is still functioning highly. They are just there for the economy. Obviously, they're going to corrode the government and overthrow. Maggie. Okay. All right, here we go to the boards. <coughs> On your whiteboard, what is it called when I need a refueling port? What is it called when I need a refueling port? So I don't let other countries see, see my state secret. Kellen. Military. There you go. On your whiteboard, please tell me what colony is known as the jewel in the English crown. What do you got, Sadie? On your whiteboard, please tell me what is... Uh, what is going to allow colonies to be more domineering in their control and have a direct control over colonies that will really uh, allow the imperialists to control everything? Ben? The telegraph. the telegraph. On your whiteboard, what connects the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea? Shivani? On your whiteboard, what connects the Atlantic and Pacific? Logan? Panama. On your whiteboard, please tell me, who believed that if it wasn't for imperialism, the people would have a civil war because nothing else would make them feel superior? Natalie? Cecile Rose. On your whiteboard, please tell me who's the guy who believes it's white people's responsibility to educate the rest of the non-Westerners? Who is it, Vendela? Rudard Kipling. On your whiteboard, what is the name of Kipling's book? I'm tired of talking. It's like a period. This isn't good. No. What's his most famous book, Jackson? Oh, I answered. Yes, he did do the Jungle Book. But did someone write that? Someone did. Huh? Jungle Book is probably more famous like now. More people have heard of Jungle Book. Uh, White Man's Burden is way more influential. It's more important. I never heard of White Man's Burden, but I did hear of Jungle Book. There you go. Which also spouts White Man's responsibilities, by the way. That makes sense. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is it called that Americans had the right to exploit cheap labor here in the United States? That if the, if the Irish showed up, it was our right to put them into cheap jobs. What is it, Macy? Manifest destiny. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is one motivation for uh, imperialization that the French really used? This made them feel better about themselves, even though they're terrible people. What is it, no, Amy? Religion is used as a justification. All right, let's go back to here. Okay, so now please listen. You're going to add this to your notes. The British never over, like, raised guns and took control over India. There was no conflict of British taking over India. They were there, they were kind of welcomed under the sphere of influence to a degree by the Mughal. They just never left and kept getting bigger. Does that make sense? It was more like an infection. I've heard it explained as the British infection on India, that it eventually just becomes inflamed and just bursts open. And in my head, it's like little spiders come up. In my head, that's what it is. But I, I like that explanation of the British in India. It's just like an infection. It starts as something small and manageable. And because it didn't go checked, it just becomes, it erupts. And eventually, it's gonna, they're going to take complete control. And it's called the doctor, a doctrination of lapse. And that's what we call it, the technical term. Now, you do need to know that the British are going to hire Indians to fight for the British. You need to write that down. They're called sepoys. The British hire Indians to fight for the British. 
and they're called sepoys. This is a big deal because we have the Sepoy Rebellion. So, Sepoys are British soldiers of Indian descent in India. They were given new guns and a rumor broke out saying that the guns were lubricated with beef fat or pork fat. Now, guns up until the 1950s were all lubricated with natural products, which means you would make bacon in the morning and then you grease up your gun after you went shooting with that bacon fat to keep it from uh, jamming and locking and all that stuff. That's how you used to do it. Now today, are people walking around with beef fat on their guns? No, we have synthetic stuff, which means it's non, uh, non-animal products now. But they used to do it, so it's very common. Back in these days, they'd have to lubricate their guns with either beef or pork. Now, the rumor broke out that it was beef, and in some places the rumor broke out that it was pork. Why would this be a problem in India, Maggie? Um, There you go. And the Sepoys are making up part of the British regime, and they're going to be a mix because India is a mix. This is going to cause a problem in a rebellion. It's a small rebellion. It's not a big one. It's going to be put down pretty quickly. And it happens in 1857. You do need to know that. Okay? However, you're going to write impact. Write your impact. It is going to cause anti-British sentiment throughout all of India that will continue to grow. So before the Sepoy Rebellion, people were kind of like, this is so annoying, the British are annoying. After it, people were like, oh, I hate the British. And that's just going to eventually lead till 1947 when India gets its independence. Okay, so small-scale rebellion is going to lead into British sentiment. Okay, British, don't worry, the British get a hand over it. Don't you worry. Other impacts of it. You need to know that the British abolished uh, uh, abolished the Mughal Empire. So is there any Indians in government anymore? Nope. The British take over full government control. There's no more Indian representatives in India's government. You are going to see that they are going to abolish the East India Trade Company. That has been around since the 1400s. Why do you think they abolished it? Who is managing all the guns in this revolt? Jesse. Yeah. So instead of giving this power to a corporation, now the government of of Britain is just going to completely control it for itself. So it's now going to become a direct control colony of India. Okay? And you need to know it establishes a direct rule of India by the British government. It's no longer controlled by a corporation. It's now controlled by the British government. So, good thing or bad thing for India? Bad. Bad, yes. Now, eventually it will lead to their independence, which is a good thing for them. However, it's going to be a dark 90 years to go. Well, they've been there already for probably about 60. It is very sad. It's only going to get worse. So, you do need to know. You're going to write pros and cons. Actually, you're going to write... Uh, sugar knife of imperialism, write it down. The sugar knife of imperialism, write it down. Sugar knife of imperialism is that the Europeans brought both positives and negatives. Europeans brought both positives and negatives to their colonies. So it's called a sugar knife. Because is being a colony a good thing or a bad thing long term? Bad thing long term. However, there are some improvements to it. So, in India, let's talk about some pros. Okay, the pros are the organization of agriculture. India becomes the largest producer of tea, coffee, and opium in the world. I bet they're really proud of the opium part. I'm just kidding. Okay. They used to be the largest producer of tea, coffee, and opium in the world. The British are the ones who organize all the farming systems and allow them to be. Infrastructure. The British are going to build 
roadways, bridges, canals, irrigation systems. Is that an improvement? Yes, that's a huge improvement. India today still really depends on the British and, and the British and the British infrastructure. Wait, that was the word. I was <laughs> infrastructure. It's bridges, canals, roadways, and irrigation systems. That the British are going to build. Okay. Now the cons. Are pretty significant, but we're going to keep it simple. We got two positives, we'll do two cons. Uh, the eradication of uh, Indian culture is a huge one, and one they're still trying to reel with. Eradic uh, eradication of Indian culture. You're also going to see that the British are going to turn Indians against other Indians, they're going to divide them to make it easier for them to conquer. They're going to employ and put some higher up and push some lower, and that's going to cause conflict. So they're going to divide and cause more social stratification. Okay, Central Asia, we're going to keep this really simple here. Central Asia, we're just going to have the great game. You need to know the great game. It's between Russia and Britain. Central Asia, you just need to know the great game. It's about Afghanistan. The British and the Russians kept acting like they were going to go to war with each other. One would uh, increase tension one way, the other one would respond to increase tension, but no one wanted to declare war. So they just kept, you know, like, have you ever gone into, like, uh, a thing with your brother and sister where you say something and then they say something mean and then you say something meaner and then they say something meaner and then you just hit them in the arm and then they hit you in the arm and then you like punch them in the face and then they punch you in the face and then you're in a full on brawl. Yes? That is what is happening here except they don't get into a brawl. They're just going like tit for tat going back and forth and it looks like any moment they're going to explode into an imperialist war. Right Katie? Are you texting your friends to tell them about the great game? It's really exciting. Honestly, you look shady as hell, girl. So, you do need to know, no war happens, but because the Industrial Revolution, uh, because the Russian Revolution happens. So, a great game. Nothing happens because of it, but it is going to increase tension. AP loves this shit. I don't understand why I have to teach it to you, because nothing happens. But it is going to increase tension. So, the great game is Russian versus British in Afghanistan. Um, however, it is going to have a lasting effect because the British are going to kick the Russians out of Afghanistan in the 1960s. So, we'll see that. so it didn't happen because of the Russian Revolution? Yeah, the Russian Revolution collapses itself. Southeast Asia, you need to know that the British are going to build a new city called Singapore. Goodbye. We're a little behind. But that's okay. We're like two slides behind. It will be okay. All right. Goodbye. Should we watch the video tonight? No. You are the video. Are we behind? Yeah, I started yesterday with them, but I think they're the only ones.